The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for another Learning Lunch hosted by FormatApproved.com. My name is Brian Johnson. I'm the Senior Director of Online Training and Education with Formed Training, and I'll be your moderator today. Today's Learning Lunch will cover revenue growth, improving practices for better medical billing. We are joined today by James Vecchi of NewSoft Technologies. James has a wealth of experience in medical billing and revenue cycle management, and we are pleased to share his ex expertise with you today. Please note that you can ask questions of our presenter at any time during today's session by entering them into the chat area during the presentation. In the second half of our session, we will address as many questions as time allows. If we do run out of time, Answers to all submitted questions will be posted to our website and sent via email link later in the week. Also, please note that all registered attendees of today's session will receive an email with links to both the recorded and PDF versions of the event. All right, James, well, thank you for joining us today. Let's go ahead and begin. Thanks, Brian. So let's start with revenue cycle management. What does RCM mean to a practice? That's a great question. So really, you know, RCM means different things to every practice, but um, one universal point is that uh, it means, you know, how do I increase my revenue stream? Um, and, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can do that. Um, but really, the biggest are going to be looking at ways to uh, decrease rejections. That, that's, uh, that's one piece. So decreasing rejections and also looking at ways to decrease cost. Um, and we're going to look at more of the ways we can do those, but um, decreasing rejections is really the, the biggest area that most practices can, can see improvement upon. And, um, you know, there's a lot of different ways to do that. One of, one of those ways would be simply verifying, you know, your insurance uh, information before you see a patient. Um, another good way to, uh, to do that is, is just to make sure that uh, all your demographics are entered in correctly. And these are really basic steps uh, when you're first uh, intaking a patient, uh, but they're they're really crucial, and, and some people might argue, you know, the most important because if you, you know, you have the wrong information when it comes time for your biller or your your outsourced billing company to take hold of that claim and, and send it, um, you know, those errors are going to cost you time, and that that is going to eventually cost you more money. Um, of course, then that you know, there's the time value of money as well, so. If you're getting rejections and uh, those are not being followed up on promptly, you know, they have a, a tendency to slip through the cracks. And that kind of leads us to the next point here, which is reducing your accounts receivable. And, um, you know, accounts receivable is a, is a part of billing for every practice. It's unavoidable and it's kind of just part of the way that the insurance system works. And, um, you know, I think that's led to some complacency for some practices. Um, and they, their expectations of what their AR should look like uh, are a little bit unrealistic, in my professional opinion. And, um, you know, really this leads to some neglect at times of, of AR and, and uh, neglect of following up on claims. Uh, and especially, you know, if you're, if you're still using a paper um, system to, to manage your, your claim submission, um, it makes that task a lot more difficult. So. Some of the things you can do there to, uh, to improve that process, um, you know, have procedures in place uh, so that you're following up on AR in a timely manner. Um, you know, I would suggest daily, but that's not always feasible for every practice. So you really have to find out what's right for you. Um, other ways to do that are obviously look at, you know, electronic systems which will make managing uh, that process easier. And, um, you know, a lot of different things you can do, but really just uh, making an effort to put in, in place some procedures uh, where you're, you're looking at your AR on a regular basis. I would say, you know, do a good review monthly, but then also quarterly look at your AR numbers and say, you know, how have we improved or, or, you know, how have things gotten worse and what can we do to fix that? Uh, a lot of times it's just a matter of being on top of that every day and following up on claims whenever possible, um, as quickly as possible, I should say. 
So you've talked a little bit about some of the things people should do, but what are some of the most important steps for successful medical billing then? Yeah, so really this is, uh, you know, getting to kind of the, the intake process and, um, you know, the first things you should do when you, you see a patient. And uh, those are some of the most important, as I already kind of touched on. But making sure your, your demographics and insurance are entered correctly is, is really crucial. Um, like I already said, if, if the biller has to come back to you um, and, and kind of revisit that claim, that's just more time you're spending on that claim that, that could have been uh, taken care of up front. Um, from there, you know, the insurance verification is really crucial. Um, there's a couple different reasons for that. Uh, you know, one, if you're using an e-verify uh, system, a system that has electronic insurance verification, you're going to automatically ensure that your, your demographics are correct because you're actually going to be in, in real time querying the insurance database to make sure that their policy is active. You can check on, you know, copay and, and uh, deductible amounts. A lot of different information is available there for you. Um, and so that's a really, really uh, valuable tool for the front office. And, uh, you know, it's also going to ensure, like I said, that demographics are entered incorrectly. Um, you know, second of all, that's going to ensure that the plan is even active. Um, you, you know, there there's so many times that um, that kind of thing can can slip people's mind, and you know, maybe maybe something changed at work and they weren't aware of it, or um, you know, they missed a payment, something like that. So that's another basic problem that you can kind of nip in the bud. Um, you know, and thirdly. There's a there's a huge growing problem with insur medical insurance fraud. It's I believe the third fastest growing type of fraud in the United States, um, and so this will really, you know, make sure that uh, in, in a in a in a nice um, you know non intrusive way I guess I should say that you're not offending anyone, but you can make sure you know you're collecting their ID and their insurance card at the same time, and you can verify that against the actual insurance records and. Um, you know that'll that'll save you some headache down the line if uh, if you run into that. So if I could just um, hop in to ask a quick question, is it usually the case? And I know that your expertise is not in fraud per se, but is it just that people are yeah. taking other people's insurance and using it, or so it's kind of an identity fraud type thing? It is, yeah. That, that's my understanding, and, and you're right. I'm not a not an expert, but that's uh, that's my understanding, and that's kind of what we've run into, um, and we were able to catch that, or I should rather say that our um, our clients were able to catch that using uh, electronic uh, verification and kind of take care of that before it became an issue, before that claim actually got billed, because then you can you can kind of run into some problems there as well. So but that, that is correct. All right. Well, please continue. Of course. Um, so you know, from once once you've insured, uh, verified that insurance, and you know everything is entered in correctly, uh, you know you you see the patient and everything goes well there. Um, really, the the most important step from that point on is making sure that that claim is is filed in a timely manner, same day if possible, and then really you know regular follow up. Um, this this can't be overstated enough because you know we all know that that claims are rejected, um, and in my opinion, more often than they should be, and oftentimes you get claims rejected with a a very small issue or, you know, sometimes I've even seen claims rejected for no discernible issue. Um, technicalities, any, anything that's, that's uh, wrong with a claim or even could be interpreted as wrong can be used to reject it. And uh, I've seen it time and time again. So, you know, making sure that uh, you have a process in place and, and possibly a person who, you know, just goes through and, and makes sure that those rejections are taken care of on a daily basis um, is really important. So what's the best time then for a practice to collect co-pays and outstanding balances? Well, you know, it's, it's really um, up front is, is the easy answer there. And um, you really want to be collecting up front because you don't want to have to, you know, go back and, and you know, try to collect copay or, you know, a deductible, for example, from a patient after you, you see them for the visit. Um, you know, in some practices that may be standard and it may work, work for your practice, but in our opinion, um, based on the data we've seen, you're able to more consistently collect that payment up front. 
I um, mean, it's it's just I think a simple matter of, of human nature. Um, you know, after you see the doctor, you know, for whatever reason, you're probably not going to want to stick around too much longer. You've got places to go, and um, you know, we we've, we've seen uh, you know, sometimes 25% higher rates of of copay and uh, deductible collection uh, if you're if you're doing it before the the visit. So uh, we always recommend that. Also, you know, if you don't have to go and, you know, say you missed the patient on the way out for whatever reason or, or they weren't able to pay then, um, you know, or, or just didn't feel like sticking around to do it, you're going to save yourself um, from doing, you know, some statement work on the back end, you know, printing and, and mailing and, and stuffing envelopes. If you're doing it manually, um, you know, that, that can be a, a big cost in manpower as well as in uh, materials. But also, you know, if you're, even if you're doing it electronically, um, you're still going to have to go through and, and make sure you verify those balances and, and reconcile them when you do get the payment in the mail and go to the bank, all those kind of things. You're going to save yourself a lot of time if you just do it up front. Um, and I think the patient will also appreciate you know, knowing ahead of time you know, what, what their balance is going to be. Um, and then from a, from a bookkeeping standpoint, um, this allows you to really easily at that time kind of you know, filter the patient on to the doctor and while they're once you've uh, got their payment, you can go ahead and record that if you're using an electronic system, and uh, you know make sure that your your records are correct and and their balance is up to date. So that's also a, a really important issue. So what's the best way to learn about coding changes? I think everybody knows that ICD-10 is on the horizon, and um, how mm -hmm. should practices prepare for some of the changes that are on the way? Yeah, and uh, that, that's that's a, a good point. You know, ICD-10 has been kind of looming for a couple years now, and um, you know, it's one of those things that keeps changing. Um, they, I think they push it back two or three times now. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it was more, and I've just stopped paying as much attention. Um, but it, it is seems to be uh, this date seems to be sticking a little bit more, and um, it, it is up and coming. That's going to be a huge change, and it's going to affect practically every specialty. Um, so good ways to get in front of that now are, um, as you can see here, you know, join your, your specialty association. Um, you know, sometimes it's a state association, sometimes national. There's always going to be a national one, but uh, there's, there's oftentimes state as well that maybe uh, can help you uh, stay on top of, you know, if there's statewide changes that aren't, aren't affecting uh, other providers in your specialty nationally. Um, so join in as many of those as you can, and um, you know, really joining is not enough. You you want to do you want to get on their mailing list, um, and maybe you don't necessarily want to, but you want to have someone in the office um, who who is on that mailing list and who is going to actually do the due diligence and and kind of be your point person if it's not going to be you directly um, reading those really gathering what's the most crucial information for you, what, what changes are coming your way, um, and then keeping you, you posted on those things, and, and maybe even you know, putting together some kind of a quick synopsis from what they've learned. So um, that's, that's really one of the best ways we've found. All of our billers and coders um, you know, are subscribed to multiple different associations, and um, it's really one of the only you know, reliable ways to stay on top of all the changes that are happening, even between the big code set changes. Um, but yeah, ICD-10 is going to be a big one, and, that, and that's going to be a big resource for, for you guys if you can uh, be, a, be associated with them. Um, so even in a smaller practice, it's advisable to have someone who, in addition to the other hats they wear, you really need someone who's basically a coding champion, so to speak, who, can, who is responsible for kind of being the eyes and ears for the practice. Yeah, I would de definitely agree. And you know, if you're a really small practice, and and I work with a lot of them, um, oftentimes that's going to be the the physician, um, or you know, whoever is the uh, the actual billing provider. Um, and it really behooves you to kind of be, uh, you know, an expert on coding because that's really where the rubber meets the road in in terms of your um, in terms of your financial stability of the practice. Even small. Uh, mistakes or you know if, if there are new modifiers that, that need to be applied um, you know that those they may not get rejected and, and to me those are actually some of the most insidious um, coding change issues um, 
you could have a, a, a very small change to the way something is coded that you may not know about for years. And the code, uh, that claim will still get accepted by the insurance company, but because you're not doing it in particularly the right way that they want to see it, they may reduce your, uh, your payments on that claim. Um, and it may be subtle enough where you don't see it for years. I've, I've seen that many, many times. And um, you know, it may seem like a small amount per claim, in it, and it really is. Um, but I've seen you know, 5% of a practice's revenue, potential revenue, uh, be tied up in a, in a small coding change that they didn't know about. So um, it, can, it can really make a difference. So how often should a practice submit claims then? We always recommend daily, um, and you know that for I work with primarily small offices, some some larger, um, but the bread and butter of, of my experience is with a with a small one to, to five physician practice, and a lot of times they say you know daily is too often. I don't have someone who can who can do it daily. They you know most people who work in that that size office they just they wear, like you said, they wear too many hats, um, and they just don't have time, uh, to, you know, to wear this hat on a daily basis. But it's really important to do it daily or as close to daily as possible. Um, the number one reason is that it really is just going to make sure your um, sort of your 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 uh, list of of claims doesn't grow to an unmanageable size. Um, you know, you're kind of getting things off your plate on an ongoing basis, and that's often much easier to manage um, than it is, you know, doing it weekly as, as it was often done in the past. Um, and we're seeing a move away from that weekly or bi-weekly billing even um, to a more daily cy revenue cycle of billing because it really ensures a, a constant revenue cycle. Um, you know, instead of getting a big check twice a month or three times a month, uh, you're going to get you know, smaller checks on a daily or, or, you know, every few day basis. And um, it allows you to really focus on each individual claim and make sure that all the details are, are correct and, you know, modifiers applied, correct codes, you know, is, is the visit billed to the, to the right extent it should be. Um, you know, there's a big problem with physicians both under and over coding. Um, and so it's a lot easier to kind of make sure that, um, that's that's uh, being addressed uh, on a smaller scale on a daily basis than it is to have to go back two weeks or a week and say, hey, doctor, when you saw this patient, how long was it? Or, you know, you, it, it's not as fresh in your mind or as fresh in the uh, physician's mind. Um, and so it's really, that's one of the biggest reasons we think daily basis is it's a good way to do it. Um, also, you know, you can you can scrub the claim right away if you're using an electronic system, which most folks are, um, or going through the, uh, you know, the online portals. And, um, you know, if there's, a, if there's an issue, then you can address it with the doc right away. And like I said, it's still fresh in your mind, you, in, in their mind, and you guys can make the, the change to that claim um, without having to, you know, go through a lot of uh, searching and looking through old paperwork, that kind of thing, if necessary. Um, also, there's the sort of the time value here. Um, if you're if you're having to wait uh, on checks from insurance constantly, um, you know that there's really a, a value to your time having your reimbursements in the bank as soon as possible. And a lot of that has been addressed by you know using electronic um, EOBs or they call them ERAs if you're not familiar with them, um, electronic remittance advice, you can get paid much more quickly using those. Um, you know, sometimes a matter of days, or I've even seen, you know, within 24 to 48 hours for some insurance companies, rather than waiting a week or two for a check. And um, if you're doing things entirely electronically, um, you're really going to see the time value of that. So um, that's another big issue. Um, you know, and just overall, making sure that uh, you're, you're kind of on top of the finances on a daily basis. Um, you know, it's, if you have an electronic system, you know, running reports in real time makes a huge difference because you can kind of be aware of your financial situation, be aware of what's going on with your claims, and make decisions based on real data that you have and really look at your revenue stream and, and say, from a business perspective, which a lot of doctors 
um, you know, don't often do uh, and don't think about. They may leave that to the office manager, but uh, you know, it's it's really crucial to the survival of your business. How can a practice avoid claims rejections? Uh, you already mentioned some of the things that might cause rejections, but tell us a little bit more about what practices can do to avoid them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And um, I think one of the biggest is uh, you know moving to a fully electronic um, method, whether that's like I said, um, you know, going through the web portals for individual insurance companies, or you know, ideally using a practice management system uh, that allows you. To, to do this all electronically, simply because um, that data is all in one place for everyone working on that claim. Um, and whether that's just the biller and the doctor, or there's you know multiple hands working on it as it moves through its life cycle, um, it, it ensures a continuity, um, and it, it ensures that uh, if there are, is an error, it's more likely to be picked up and taken care of. Um, it also really helps with tracking so, you know, if you get a rejection in the mail, um, that's a piece of paper, you know, an EOB in the mail with a rejection, that's a piece of paper that can be lost. And oftentimes they are. Um, you know, I've seen the, the boxes and boxes of old EOBs that nobody really knows what's going on with them and nobody's looked at them in a long time. You can see the dust on top. And uh, we've, we've gone through many of those boxes um, trying to get a practice back on track. And, Oftentimes you find, you know, when you get halfway through the box, some of those EOBs are over a year old, uh, you know, two, three years old, and they're, you know, past the point of, of being worth uh, following up on. Um, you may not get anything. You may get such a small percentage that uh, it's just really just not worth your time. So that's all lost money, um, and that's that's really gets to the, you know, letting rejections pile up issue. Um, and, and one of the reasons why we really harp on sort of daily billing as a, as a, as a kind of the new gold standard for billing um, because it really makes it difficult to, to have those rejections pile up. You're, you're, you're working on claims going out the door, you know, new claims, and then once that's done, you go look at those rejections from yesterday, for example, and, and you kind of take care of those. It's much, more, it's much more manageable on the rejection side to uh, pick up the phone and call the insurance company you know, you're going to be on the phone for a half hour, possibly, for each claim that you need to um, follow up on. And if you've got two or three of those, um, that's that's more doable than, uh, for example, you know, having a week or two's worth. Um, also, you know, if you're doing it daily and you're you're kind of following all these procedures we've talked about, you'll find, I think, that the majority of the the AR issues that most practices see, which is, you know, generally just a growing um, AR trend over you know 180 days for example or 90 days um, you're going to see that start to decrease and uh, you know start to reverse itself and what that's going to mean for you is is more money in the bank essentially and, and more money in the bank sooner instead of having to wait until near timely filing deadlines uh, to be reimbursed you're, you're going to be able to get that within a few weeks at the most. So you've mentioned accounts receivable. When what is the best way for practices to manage those accounts receivable issues? Um, you know, one of the we always talk about doing it daily, and that's how um, that's how my billing folks handle AR. But you know, like I said, many practices don't have the resources to do that. Um, so in those cases, we, we say, you know, at least two days a week, you should have someone, you know, preferably a trained billing person, um, working on your AR. And this really is going to make sure that, um, you know, your, your, aging, uh, your aging claims kind of get taken care of first. Um, obviously, you want to look at highest value by age. So if something's about to go to that timely filing deadline and it's, it's a big value claim, definitely want to spend your time working on that. Um, but you know, if if you're uh, if you're really doing a good job of doing this, you know, a couple times a week, it, it shouldn't be an issue to kind of prioritize those claims um, and and see you know what's in danger of kind of falling off or falling through the cracks, and uh, what what can wait a little bit longer, and uh, you know you know having a good reporting system makes that easier. Um, so not doing it on paper um, will make that make your job a lot easier. Um, 
And so that's kind of why we talk about that a lot as well is, you know, if you don't know what needs to be worked on within your AR, um, you know, what, not, what needs to be prioritized, then you're kind of feeling your way in the dark. And, you know, having a, a good organization system electronically um, makes that possible, whereas in the past it, it wasn't as easy. Um, you know, oops, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I uh, didn't mean to cut you off there. Go ahead and continue with what you were going to say. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I was kind of just kind of circle back and say, you know, AR is not as difficult to manage um, if, if the processes are in place to do, uh, you know, billing on a daily basis that we've kind of been talking about throughout this presentation. And uh, I think uh, if you implement those, a lot of the AR problems you may be used to seeing um, will, will somewhat diminish or, or entirely go away. And, um, you know, if, you, if you're at least taking care of AR two days a week, then you should be in a much better spot than, than where you were previously. So let's talk a little bit about back office billing. What are best practices for managing that? Um, yeah, so you know HIPAA is something that affects all sides of the practice, obviously, but it's it's really important, obviously, for um, for the back office, um, and it's it's really one of the biggest challenges um, that they face, I think, because it's so easy to to become uh, complacent, and um, you know it, it's it's easy to uh, to slip up on on some of those things if, uh, if you're not vigilant. So um, one, one really big asset, I think, is using a HIPAA compliant uh, practice management and EMR software system. Um, you know, what this is going to do is allow you to really manage your, your documentation um, and, you know, all of your billing and, and um, the statements and all, all that stuff in a HIPAA secure environment. Um, you know, paper can be taken, uh, you know, if you have a server on site, someone could break in and, and take that. So, um, you know, having a really good HIPAA compliance system will take care of, you know, a large majority of your problems. But then also, you know, sometimes that can institute some complacency. So, for example, you've got a great HIPAA compliant um, electronic health record, but for whatever reason, um, you know, you have your password written down on you know, on the computer. Um, you know, that's a big no-no, and uh, it's it's more common than, than most people would think. So we hear you know, that quite a bit, actually. The, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, it's kind of one of those things where you've you've got it locked in the safe, but you've left the key out on the desk, and um, that really is something that um, you've got to watch out for. One thing we uh, would recommend is that someone uh, in the office, usually an office manager is going to be your sort of uh, HIPAA compliance officer and you know they should um, you know they should definitely research um, you know the biggest issues in the office uh, that they can kind of keep an eye on and and really be the advocate for for HIPAA compliance in the office and um, just make sure everybody's compliant because really that HIPAA has got a lot more sting now um, you know you can be fined up to one and a half million for data breaches um, if you have a breach of over 500 patients, for whatever whatever kind of information gets out about them, uh, you actually have to notify a local media outlet of that breach. So, for for a large hospital system, this might be something they can a blow they could absorb. But for a independent practice, it's something that could absolutely ruin you and ruin your reputation. So, yeah, and if I could just you know, follow up on that, uh, we do quite a bit of HIPAA education. Um, uh, something to note as well is that the Office for Civil Rights, which enforces that, will actually take you and put you on their so-called wall of shame, which is a website they maintain to publicize people who have breached more than 500 records. And it could be as simple as losing a laptop that has protective health information in it that's not encrypted, even if there's no evidence that it was ever accessed. So it's, a, it's easier to get in trouble than people may realize. Mm -hmm, definitely. And, you know, a lot of times I think um, the, the fines – as daunting as they may be, you know, most small practices, if you're not doing, if you're not, you know, distributing that information maliciously, you're not going to be fined a, you know, a million dollars. Um, you know, they, they take that into account. However, you know, having to notify the media um, locally where your business is based is, is going to be, I think, the more ruinous piece of the puzzle there. And um, definitely want to avoid that at all costs. And obviously, we, 
we all want to make sure that our patient's data is uh, taken care of in the way that we would want our own. Um, and so this is just uh, one of those things that really it's easy to set up and um, you know have someone be the compliance officer, but you really need the right person who's going to stick to it and be kind of ever vigilant for you. All right, so uh, what other issues are there related to back office billing? Um, you know, really it's um, making sure that, uh, you know, documents are in the right place. Um, you, you don't want to be audited, but it's a, it's a fact of life, and, um, you know, it, it, you got to be ready for it. And um, really, if you can make sure that you have a system in place that allows you to easily manage your, your documentation, um, pre-offs and, and EOBs that may come in through the mail still. If you can scan those in, then you can really, you know, make sure you're audit proof. If you're using an EMR, it makes it even easier because, you know, they can come in and they can see exactly the doctor's decision-making process on how to code this and that, what was done during that visit. You know, really the more data you have, the more audit proof the practice is going to be. And also, you know, if you're maintaining a regular billing cycle, um, it's easier to make sure that you're doing those things and that the coding is correct and you're not improperly upcoding because you can take the time to look at each one of those claims um, and just, just really make sure that everything is buttoned up and, and ready to go. And uh, then you have a record of that that, you know, should be um, pretty, pretty darn audit proof. Um, you know, also having good communication with your uh, with your back office, with your billing folks, um, they're really going to be your kind of your eyes um, on the front lines as far as the finances are concerned, and and they're going to be the ones who can you know first see um, trends, whether good or bad, and uh, and bring those to your attention, and and that's going to really allow you to react accordingly. Um, you know, you may need to see more patients, and maybe that's something that they're going to bring up to you. They're, they're going to say, hey, you know, we're, our reimbursements are going down on our, you know, our key um, procedure, for example, and um, maybe we need to open up for another day or something like that. Those kind of big, high-level decisions uh, can often be informed um, in a more timely manner if you have a good person on the billing side who can kind of not just look at the day-to-day, um, which is, of course, important, but looking at the revenue cycle as a, as a quarter, as a, as a year, for example, is something that a lot of times, you know, the independent practice isn't good at doing. And um, that's something we try to do for our clients. But, um, you know, it's important to kind of you know, take, um, take that responsibility on yourself and really look at the practice as a business because, you know, it is. And um, some doctors don't like to look at it that way. Uh, but, you know, you need to, the bottom line is you need to be able to, you know, keep your employees paid and happy and your, bill, and your lights on so you can stay open and take care of more patients. And that's really what our goal is, is to, to make you more successful with what you have um, so that you, you can continue to do that and do the work that you do. So talk a little bit, if you could, about how a practice can optimize their billing staff resources. Yeah, and um, we've kind of touched on this as well. You know, most practices have one person, or, or maybe they have one person wearing multiple hats that isn't a full-time billing person. Um, and if, if that's the case, then you really need to make sure that person is, uh, is, is your kind of your billing guru. And one of the ways to do that is to, you know, have them do some continuing education. Um, obviously, if you can hire someone who has that knowledge and the experience, then you know that's preferable, but that's not always something that uh, practice can afford or um, is able to do for whatever reason. So if you can have that person, um, you know, participate in webinars, maybe like the one you're in right now, uh, <laughs> you know, on an ongoing basis over lunch or you know, um, you know, take an hour out of the day to go look at some coding changes. There's you know, there's lots of different. Uh, webinars and, and good educational resources out there that they can take advantage of for free. Um, you know, also if you're looking to do a little more comprehensive, um, there there are often paid classes. Um, you could even, you know, have that person in, you know enroll as a uh, in billing school. Um, you know, and go and, and look at getting a higher education for billing. Um, 
go for a CPC designation if necessary. So there's a lot of different ways you can approach it. It really just depends on, you know, what, what is your practice willing to do? Is it is, is a free class or a free webinar? Is that sufficient? Uh, you know, you've already got someone knowledgeable who just needs to kind of keep the knife sharp. Uh, or do you have someone more inexperienced and you kind of need to, uh, you know, build them up more from the ground? You really have to look at that yourself and, and determine what's right for you. But, you know, almost everybody can, can benefit from uh, having the knife sharpened, as I said, and, and you know, participating in some online education. Um, you know, secondly, look at all the best practices we've talked about. The daily billing, um, you know, at least two or three times a week, uh, looking at your AR. Um, really looking at a high level at your finances. All of those things are sort of, uh, you know, administrative level best practices that you can put into place that, that can, you know, really help the practice, um, you know, become more financially stable and, uh, and, and profitable. Um, and also from a, you know, from a HIPAA standpoint, having those policies in place and having them, you know, having an advocate who actually makes sure that they're followed and, and that they're uh, maintained over time is really, really helpful. Um, and then, of course, you know, communication um, is, is going to be really crucial. You know, your, your billing folks are the link between you and the financial uh, success of the practice. And you need, to, you need to have great communication for everything to work out well. I've, I've seen too many times where you know, you've got a great billing person and a great doctor, and they just, for whatever reason, they can't come together. And you know things tend to fall apart when there's no communication. So, making making that a priority is is something you should really look at. Um, and you know transparency, I think, is is the foundation of good communication in the biller client relationship. Especially if you're uh, if you're doing billing with an outsourced company, uh, you really want to have 100% transparency so that you have the trust, so that you know this person is on top of your finances for you. Um, and that, you know, that, that will kind of color the rest of your relationship. So what's some quality control measures that uh, a practice can look at to be sure that these uh, strategies for revenue cycle management and billing are actually working? Um, yeah, so, you know, one of the good ways is to just kind of institute a, uh, a review process. Um, it's something that we do with all of our billing folks, and I think it really allows you, uh, and even non-billing folks actually, it allows you to kind of step back and, and look at um, not just as the practice owner or the physician, but as an employee, you get to step back and look at, you know, what, what have I done in the, uh, in the past month or the past uh, quarter? Um, you know, what do my numbers look like if you're, if you're a billing person? And uh, how could I improve upon that? And it really just, um, I think more than looking at the numbers and actually having that conversation, just knowing that that's something that is going to be a regular part of your job will make folks perform better because they know they've got that. Uh, it, it's really a, a matter of, um, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not finding the correct word here. It's uh, accountability is what I'm looking for. So you know that your your work is going to be reviewed um, and you you know most people have great pride in the work they do and they want to make sure that that review goes really well and um, you know another way to do that is to find qual qualified people um, make sure that they're surrounded by other qualified folks and the right uh, processes and procedures and uh, you know just make sure that those uh, processes are being followed consistently and uh, you know we've talked about a lot of different best practices, but um, if they're not followed, then of course, you know, the wheels fall off the bus. So, you know, having a good office manager is, is one way to do that. Um, someone who really kind of is a stickler for the policies and not in, a, not in an overbearing way, but just make sure that folks are trained up uh, correctly and, and they're meeting the expectations that are in place. And then, you know, I think one of the biggest um, issues that I see is, is uh, practices, especially small practices, not treating it like a business. Um, and you know it is. We, we've, talk, we've talked about, you know, you're, as the physician, your job is, is taking care of the patient, but you need to have the revenue to do so. You need to be able to keep your lights on. And um, like I said, a lot of practices don't like to think of things in, that, in those terms, but um, 
that, that's the reality of the situation. So kind of approaching the overall business policies, uh, or excuse me, the overall practice policies from a business standpoint is something that can be really valuable and can really make a difference in the way uh, billing is done and, and, uh, and managed. And then, um, you know, that, that, that's really it, is, is talking about the revenue stream. Um, it is important to patient care. If you can't afford supplies, you can't afford to keep the lights on, then you, you, you can't afford to uh, then see the patients. And so that's the ultimate goal, is to make the, the practice really stable and uh, profitable. And, uh, you know, everybody has a job and is able to, to take care of patients the way um, they set out to do. All right, well, we have plenty of time for questions and answers. If you'll bear with me for just a moment while I bring those up. I'm going to encourage our attendees to go ahead and ask questions of our expert. Um, I think his knowledge on revenue cycle management and billing, I've certainly learned a lot myself here. The first question I'd like to ask, James, is you, you talked before about uh, undercoding, and I think that's pretty obvious what that would be, but what's an example of overcoding uh, where a physician would be overcoding on a claim? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So overcoding, I think, is, is less common than undercoding, certainly. Um, and usually when we see overcoding, um, you know, I guess I want to phrase this carefully, but a, a lot of times that can be, could be construed as a malicious um, uh, you know, maybe that's too strong of a word, but um, really, you d overcoding is more dangerous certainly than undercoding. Um, I don't see it as often as I used to, um, but and maybe that's because more more uh, you know billing is done electronically. It's easier to track, and it's easier to with, with EHR becoming more prevalent. It's easier to see what was actually done in that visit and how much time was spent. But you know, there's timestamps in place there, so. Um, oftentimes you could see someone billing, you know, a 99214 when they should have billed a 99213. It's the most basic example. And um, really that's not a huge issue on one claim, but oftentimes when I've seen it, it's been a systematic um, overcoding problem. And uh, it, it can stem, you know, if, it, if it's not um, something that's, uh, that's premeditated. It's often, you know, a doctor who just for some reason has done things that way for a long time, um, and you know, maybe they just haven't reviewed their policy around that in a while. And um, you know, if they're lucky, they haven't been audited based on that. So you really want to avoid overcoding, um, but at the same time, you you definitely don't want to undercode. So you really want to hit the nail on the head um, and make sure that you're you're meeting all the requirements for the codes that you're using. Um, you know, whether that be time or procedures done, um, you just really want to make sure that you're doing that. And one, one good way to do that is to have a good biller who can kind of check your work for you. And so that would typically be um, a third party that a practice would bring in to look at that uh, at their practices? Yeah, there's uh, third party billing is, is obviously it's... Um, it's really increasing, and it's, it seems to be the way a lot of practices are going, um, because you know cost really it, it makes it easier to manage cost. Um, you know they've got a flat cost that they, they pay to that billing company, and the billing company takes care of the expertise. You know to, to point out those kind of issues. Um, you know the, a lot of practices still have the person in the office, and they may or may not have the expertise to point out those kind of issues. Um, so the, that's that's really a good point. Is you know, oftentimes practices are more and more turning towards the third-party billers because they do have you know the the professional experience there. So here's a question about IDs and collecting copays up front. And oh, and before I ask this question, I just want to remind our attendees because there's been a couple of questions about this that we will be sending out a follow-up email with the uh, both the PDF version of the slideshow and also a link to a video version of it. So don't worry about that. But to get to the question, uh, this question is, do people need to be checking IDs up front um, as part of their standard process of collecting copays? Maybe you could talk a little bit about that sort of front office process. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And I actually think um, you pointed out something that I may have missed. Um, 
I think I mentioned IDs, but I didn't say specifically that you should be collecting those, and that's a, that's a good catch. So you definitely should, in my opinion, and, and all of our clients, we recommend that they do this. And we actually uh, recommend that they have a, a small USB scanner, or you know, large scanner works as well, but usually it's easier to have a small little card swiping scanner that they have on the, on the front desk, and they get the they just ask for the ID and the insurance card at the same time. Um, and you know most patients have no problem you know giving that to you um, and if they if they do you know sometimes that can be indicative of, uh, of an issue there so um, definitely we consider that a, a best practice because of the fraud we talked about um, but also it gives you an opportunity to verify their information it's just an easy way to say oh, okay here's your you know your driver's license and I can just copy the information off this I don't have to bother you for as much information all right, that makes a lot of sense. Um, here's a question about patient portals. The question is, do you see patient portals technologies as an important part of billing um, in terms of patient communication in the future, or even now, uh, I would guess, would be part of the question as well? Yeah, um, definitely patient portals are kind of changing the doctor-patient relationship, I think, um, in a great way, in my opinion. Um, you know, in the future, you're going to see more and more companies with patient portals that allow you to, for example, fill out you know forms, um, release forms, consent forms, um, fill out you know your your insurance information and all your your demographics, um, and have those dumped directly into the electronic system, um, you know, before you even come in for a visit. Um, things like scheduling appointments or requesting appointments and requesting. Uh, prescription refills and those kind of things are, are you know, something that can be done now. So, uh, and, and those are, of course, part of meaningful use uh, certification, even just the, the, the level one, which we're currently operating under. Th that, those are, are all part, integral parts of that. So, and that's going to be expanded as we go to level two, whenever that uh, decides to happen. <laughs> and I, I, have, I don't have an answer for when that will be, but um, I think they're going to, continue to improve, they're going to continue to become more and more ubiquitous, and um, I think in the future you're going to see patients not really even needing to do a lot of, you know, check-in procedures, they're just going to come in and tell you their name, and you're already going to have all their information and what they're there for. You may just need to collect a copay, and, um, you know, that's, that's actually another good point there is that most of them are going to be implementing an online payment system as well, so that copay and deductible, you may already have set it up so that it's going to ask them for that when they ask for their appointment, and then go ahead and pay that online beforehand. So I definitely think that's that's going to be more and more important. So it's at least conceivable that people could walk into the waiting room and essentially, you know, uh, there's probably always going to be some waiting at the doctor's office, but there wouldn't sure. need to be any interaction with front office staff necessarily beyond saying, here I am, and then you can just walk through because you've already provided all of the necessary information. Yeah, definitely, and obviously it'll vary from uh, from office to office, but I think that's kind of where we're heading, and um, I think it's a win-win for everybody. Um, it cuts down on administrative costs, and uh, it, it frees up folks who oftentimes, you know, the front office person is, ex except in larger practices, which I don't think the need for that person will ever go away, oftentimes they're the office manager, the biller, the nurse. You know, I've, I've worked with someone who's had five job descriptions, and they, they weren't an uncommon... Uh, uh, uncommon breed, so you know th those are often the folks that really make the practice tick. And uh, having them, you know, at the front desk is really wasting a lot of their their talents and time on on something that could be an automated process. And I think it will be in the future, uh, a majority of it at least. All right, here's a HIPAA question. I know that's not the core area of your expertise, but uh, the question is about physical security around. Um, paper billing records. So if a practice does have paper records, um, do those need to be locked up to be HIPAA compliant? Um, you know, and I, I'll preface this by saying, as you did, that I'm not the expert on HIPAA, although I, you know, do have to go through a lot of training around it. Um, I would say that's probably prudent. I think it's really one of those things um, where is you know, what does locked up really mean? Does that mean locked in a file cabinet? Um, then someone could come and, you know, take a dolly and cart the whole thing away. They don't need to unlock it. They could just take the take the tower. 
Um, you know, same with, for example, a server. If you're using a, an electronic uh, system that you actually host your, your uh, system and your data on site, um, a lot of practices have done this and that, you know, during the 80s and the 90s, that was kind of the way um, that, that everybody operated. They, you know, hosted their data on site. But same thing, that server can be picked up and, and moved, especially if it's a small server, as a lot of small practices use, um, not a big tower. So um, they don't need to break into it. They don't need to hack into your system if they can just take it. And then they can at their leisure go through and try to figure out how to, to break in through the security measures. Um, which, depending on the strength of your passwords, can be very easy. You would be surprised if you're using a word, um, and even you know numbers and characters. If there's a discernible word in your password, um, you know that's in the dictionary. Oftentimes, that can be broken in a matter of a day or, or you know hours, even um, just using brute force methods. So, that's really one of those things that uh, you really have to consider when looking at how you're storing your records. Um, I just think. You know, paper records, they're inherently dangerous for, from a HIPAA standpoint because they are a physical record that can be picked up and taken. Um, they can be left out to be seen by a patient, you know, even if they don't mean to, to, to see it. Um, and, and those are the kind of things that you have to keep an eye on for sure. Um, and so from an electronic say, pers oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was, I was going to say, um, you know, I think... If, if you're still using paper records for a majority of your records, I would say, you know, now is definitely the time to look at an, an EHR, um, look at a practice management system that's electronic because, um, you know, there's a lot of incentives right now with the, with the High Tech Act. There's still incentives for, for going out and purchasing one of those um, and reimbursements available for meeting meaningful use. So you can really defray the cost of that now. When we get into 2015, those, uh, and those reimbursements will go away, and they actually have been going down every year since 2011, I want to say. Um, so, you know, if, if you were an early adopter, you could pretty much subsidize the entire cost of that system. Um, now you can you can either get pretty close, or you may still be able to do it, depending on the, uh, the cost of the system you're looking at. But um, it definitely would behoove you to move away from paper uh, as soon as possible because the cost is only going to increase as time goes on. And, um, you know, I think most practices will see a big increase in uh, efficiency by using an electronic system. And, you know, they're going to be HIPAA compliant as well. Well, and the flip side of it as well is that uh, for practices that do have Medicare billing, in 2015 it starts to flip over to penalties, which I believe they start exactly. at 1%, but then they rise by 1% for several years and reach, I, I want to say it's 3%. Uh, You're right, yeah. Billing. It uh, starts at one and then one, two, three every year. So So um, first the carrot and then the stick. Exactly. It's uh that's the way they've been doing it and um you know we've we've had a lot of folks uh, actually testify for meaningful use and it's really not that difficult of a process. You're dealing with the government, so of course there's always gonna be some rigor moral, but if you have a good EMR system, um that allows you to just go in and run the report you need to send to uh, send to the government, then you should have no problem getting your reimbursement. Um, of course, there's that initial outlay, uh, but you know there there are many many um, systems out there that deserve a look. And you know one of ours, uh, one of them definitely being NewMD, uh, the system that that we use, um, and, and that are not as expensive as you might think. I think a lot of people have a um, sort of an idea that, you know, you're looking at like maybe the, the the bigger enterprise level systems and for a small practice that's not going to be the right choice. You're going to want to look for something geared towards your the size of your practice and, and usually the price points will, will tell you if you're looking at a system that, that's made for you or not. Um, right, and even the larger companies uh, tend to have distinct, you know, hospital based versus ambulatory mm -hmm. products and there's a lot of segmentation in the market now. Yeah, I, I definitely agree, and I see that a lot. I think um, in the, even in the past few years, really it happened when the High Tech Act uh, passed and started to, to become implemented. Um, and this is what you know allowed for the reimbursements for EMRs. The EMR market kind of blew up overnight, and what you saw was not only a lot of really small companies kind of trying to get in on the game overnight, um, but you saw the big companies out there who had only, you know, enterprise systems or, or didn't really focus on their smaller, um, you know, private practice systems that they may have already had in place. They didn't focus on them. 
they really uh, poured a lot of resources into those, whether it was, you know, resources as far as developing it more, or as I saw a lot of times, pouring a lot into advertising for the system they already had. So you really want to look at how long has the system for your size practice been around, not just how long has your company been around and how long is, you know, uh, how long has your, maybe your enterprise system has been around for 20, 30 years, um, but you've just gotten into the small practice market. So what, what do you really, what can you do for me is kind of the question you want to ask and, and how long have you been doing it for practices like me? Um, because otherwise you may find yourself with a system that doesn't quite fit your needs. I think that's uh, excellent advice. So we're nearly out of time. I want to remind our attendees that we will be collecting any unanswered questions and providing written answers to those. We do have a couple of minutes left. Maybe uh, I have some housekeeping items at the end, but maybe you could take just a moment, James, and tell us a little bit more about NewSoft and uh, the services you provide to folks. Oh, of course, um, and I want to thank you guys for your time today as well. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you, but um, you know, as a as, as you can see here, I, I do work with NewSoft, and we're uh, primarily a practice management and electronic health record company. And uh, we've been in business since 1993, and uh, we actually launched our current product in uh, 2000, late 2000. So we were the first cloud-based, truly cloud-based practice management system on the market back in 2000 when, when cloud wasn't really uh, the buzzword that it is today. We were kind of breaking new ground. and. Um, you know, it, it wasn't a it wasn't as easy of a sell. Most people were using a server-based system at the time, um, and so they didn't really trust the cloud. And um, I think we've shown over the years that it is a really good way to do things. Um, it's access anywhere. As long as you have an internet connection, you can log in and you can do your work, whether that's at home, the office, or you know, even on the road. We've got um, capabilities to work with both um, PCs, Macs, and even Linux-based systems. Um, so we're completely platform agnostic. You don't need to change any of your hardware in general in the office to use our system. You just go download it, and then you can log in with your uh, your uh, your username and password that we give you, and, and start working. So um, as far as system requirements, it's very light. But the way we can do that is we're actually crunching all the numbers and doing the hard work on the back end with our servers. Um, so we do offer a, a meaningful use certified EHR, um, and we also offer full professional billing services, which is really my area of expertise um, at NewSoft. So I don't really work as much on the software side. I'm working with physicians on a daily basis, trying to uh, maximize their revenue and um, you know, see what we can do. A lot of times it's uh, clients looking to fix problems that have already been uh, created, and so we kind of go in and get our hands dirty with our team and um, tackle that mountain of AR they might have or uh, look at, you know, why are all these claims being rejected. Um, that, that's kind of our, our, our um, feather in our cap is that we've been able to rescue a lot of practices that were kind of on the brink of closing. So. Um, yeah, that really came to mind when you uh, were talking about some of the, when you mentioned, for instance, the boxes with dust on top, I thought, uh, you know, you could probably tell us stories that would, um, shock the, <laughs> be a little shocking about how bad things can get. Yeah, I, I couldn't, and just as a quick example, I had a, uh, I think one of the biggest problems we ever saw was a, a practice that was actually not doing too badly um, out in California, and uh, the doctor, just a, a solo practice, but he was doing pretty brisk business, um, and he was a um, uh, radiology, uh, and he had approximately two million dollars in AR from only <laughs> wow I want to say two and two and a half years of, of being in practice and um, you know we we were able to go in and fix that within three months um, by just putting the right people on it and putting enough people on it to uh, to clean it up and then you know we could scale back after that so that's kind of one of the things that we're able to do being an outsourced company we can go ahead and we, we have the employees you know the resources to go and say we need to put four or five people on this this huge problem that this practice has but then you know after we clean that up we can scale back and that's how we're able to kind of offer the service at the price point that we do yeah i don't know if i if i would exactly call that return on investment but it would certainly be well money well spent for a company that is two million dollars behind on payments um 
Anyway, we're nearly out of time, so I want to thank you, James, for joining us for today's Learning Lunch. I thought it was a very informative session. To thank learn, you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, to learn more about it. our industry expert, James Vecchi, and uh, you heard a little bit about NewSoft, but you can learn more about the company at www.newsoft.com. You can see the address there on your screen. I'd also like to thank all of our attendees. Remember that all registered attendees will receive an email with links to both recorded and PDF versions of this session. We're pleased to announce the addition of a new course to our training programs here at Format Approved. Visit formatapproved.com slash education slash courses underscore cmup.html, if that's not uh, too much of a mouthful. You can see the address on your screen there, to register for our new Meaningful Use course. We've been hard at work to bring you this new offering, which provides comprehensive training for both eligible professionals and eligible hospitals on both the Medicare and Medicaid incentive programs, including Stage 1 and the upcoming Stage 2 of Meaningful Use, clinical quality measures, HIPAA considerations, and more. Again, visit the URL on your screen to learn more about the course or register. You can learn more about our other training offerings at formedtraining.com. Visit formatapproved.com to learn more about our upcoming learning lunches. The Learning Lunch button will take you to our entire slate of upcoming webinars. Our next Learning Lunch will air tomorrow, June 12th, and will cover the subject of healthcare reform and ICD-10, converting anxiety into revenue, so that dovetails nicely with some of the issues we've talked about today. Keep an eye on your email box and our homepage for other upcoming topics, and thank you again for joining us today.